Hello, and welcome to The Daily Atheist. Okay, so you're a Christian, and you believe in Jesus, yada, yada, etc., etc. And, like most Christians, you're eager for the end times and the return of the Savior. Well, that's great. It all sounds soft and fuzzy, doesn't it? Ah, Jesus descending from the sky. But actually, if it all plays out like the Bible foretells, Jesus is going to have to wade through rivers of blood on his way back. The blood of the innocent, spilled by the meek, in the name of God. Confused? Stick around and I'll explain. Hi, my name is Chris. Before we get too far along, I want to tell you about a secret button that will make you tingle all over. Just click that subscribe button and hit the little bell and sit back and wait. The tingling should begin shortly. It usually starts in the nether regions. Just saying. Click the bell. Tingles. All right. So, on to the end times. Okay, when I was younger, I really got into the Bible, and there for a while I was actively looking forward to the return of the Savior, as many Christians are wont to do. Originally, my notion was the typical white light with Jesus descending through the clouds and angels singing, and we all fall to our knees and worship in glory, which now sounds like it would be all manner of fun for about 10 whole minutes. Anyway, but then I was told it was more complicated than that. Jesus was indeed going to return, but he had to destroy all of the wicked sinners and the minions of hell who walk the earth or some nonsense like that in order to purify it for his believers. Okay, so to a 10 or 12 year old boy back in the 80s during the reign of things like Dungeons and Dragons, this battle between Good and evil sounded downright enticing and fun, something worth looking forward to. I had visions of lifting my gleaming sword high in the air and the blood of the wicked staining the blade and dripping down into the dirt and then bringing the sword down upon the head of the disgusting demon or minion of hell whose gnashing teeth ripped and tore at my golden armor as this massive and epic battle for the reign of earth raged around me. Glorious trumpets blaring and the voices of angels singing heavenly war chants falling down upon the battlefield, that sort of thing. But now, as an adult, reading the text and knowing what I know about the religion and who it considers the wicked, I realize that if such a thing were to eventually take place, it would be a far different scene. Picture this. You and several members of your church are kicking in the doors of houses on your block. You're armed with guns and knives and bats, machetes and whatever weapons you have at hand. You kick in this one door and it's the house of a Muslim family. The father is in the living room with a gun and he's just blasting away as he defends his wife and three children who are huddled in the next room. But the bullets do no damage to you and your church mates for you are marked with the sign of the Lord and no power of man can harm you. So you shoot the man down, but you run out of bullets. So you resort to the bats and machetes and axes to finish off the helpless woman and her children. Now, I could end it there and move on, my point being made, but I'll no more spare you if you're a Christian than you'll spare the wicked when the Lord calls upon you to do so. So, if you're a Christian watching this, you may as well shut it off now, because I'm going to make you watch. Watch as you raise the bat high, the mother's hands in the air in self-defense. Her eyes wide with fear and tears for her fallen husband streak down her face. Her children huddled behind her as she begs for her life and the lives of her children. And you bring the bat down with a merciless thud. There is no mercy. These are the wicked minions of Satan and they had their chance to repent their sinful ways and follow Jesus. But they chose not to. They were warned. Yet they chose this. They chose this. So with glee in your heart. As you do the Lord's work, you ignore the screams of the children as the axe and the machete find their mark. Screams upon screams turn into slight gurgling noises and in silence. Your chest swells with pride. Now you're done. The wicked have been slain. You and your churchmates are covered in blood, but it's not blood. It's the glory of your loving God. You form a small circle and chant, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then you trot out the door and on to the next house. What? Is that not what you envisioned when you were told about the return of the Lamb in Revelation? 
<laughs> yes, kids, that's really what you're signing up for. Go read the text if, again if you wish. I'll give you a verse to bring my point home in case uh, the apologist among you wants to play it off as if all this is a metaphor. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. That's just one example. And of course, the book of Revelation is, full, full, is just full of them. And that's not the only way the Prince of Peace slaughters the wicked. Again, read the wicked simply as innocent non-believers. The, there's plagues and famines and fires. And another thing to consider is that these wholesale slaughter isn't a, a quick thing. It literally goes on for years and years and years because that's how long it takes to slaughter billions of people in these horrific fashions. So all these merciful, loving Christian grandmas out there are essentially praying for the day when Jesus returns, which is literally described in the Bible like the movie The Purge, except it's not for a single night, and it's not against just people you don't like. Literally, what happens on the day of the return of the Lord is the true believers um, become immune to all the laws and weapons of man, thanks to the mark of the Lord, and then the very literal religio-ethnic cleansing of the entire planet begins, slaughtering billions of people over the span of several years in the most creatively horrific fashions imaginable. It's all right there in Revelations. Go read it yourself and try to figure out where you and your family literally would be if the, in the story if it happened today. If it happened today, where would you and your family be? And some fun food for thought. Remember where these same gentle, loving, kind, psychotic believers think the souls of these wicked people go after they're dead to a burning pit of fire for all eternity to scream and claw and the gnashing of teeth until the end of days. Some serious nutbaggery going on here, folks, for those who actually believe this stuff. Not only is this one seriously messed up belief system, but when you stop and think about it, it takes a very ugly, sadistic mind to know and believe these things are coming and yet to still look forward to it with glee in your heart and a smile on your face for your Lord. It's sick. <laughs> Certainly someone who believes these things is a person who, should be, who you should be apprehensive of at best and a wise man would outright fear. But we all know that very few Christians actually understand the text of their own faith well enough to see past the, ah, Jesus is descending from heaven view of the end times. There's a lot more murder, death, kill going on than they realize. And they'll be even more shocked when they find out what actual part they are expected to play in this bloodbath. Hmm. So what are your thoughts about the Christian interpretation of the end times? Are you a Christian? And do you agree or disagree with my interpretation of the text? Why or why not? Leave me a comment below and let me know. As always, thank you for giving me your time. Please take a moment to give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, or a thumbs down if you're a sissy boy and still wet the bed every night. Remember to click the subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you get more of my craziness as I produce it. Thank you and take care.